Well, good morning, church. It is good to have you with us this morning. Great to see your faces. Uh, my name is Cliff. I'm the worship pastor here at Liberty Baptist. If you're a guest with us today, thank you so much for choosing Liberty Baptist as a place to worship for you or your family. Um, we just consider it an honor that you've come to worship with us. If you have, and if this is one of your first times and you haven't yet filled out a, uh, a visitor card, we'd love to know of your visit with us. You can just scan the QR code. If you're new at Liberty, it'll say right there in the proclaimer that you should have gotten when you came in, uh, and uh, it will ask for some, for some information. Uh, we would just love to get to know you better. It's great to have you with us this morning. I just have a couple of announcements as we lead into, believe it or not, guys, Easter at the end of this month. It's early this year, so we only have about four weeks left before Easter uh, where we celebrate the resurrection of our Savior, and leading up to that, we have a lot of different things and one we want to make you aware of. This week, we have a week of prayer. It's our Annie Armstrong week of prayer that actually started today. Our goal for this, uh, for this week of prayer is an offering of $15,000. So please be praying for our uh, missionaries, our, uh, our overseas missionaries, and consider what God would have you give towards this special offering. Um, there are, in your proclaimer, there are prayer guides and, and an envelope. And we would encourage you to use those throughout the week this week, perhaps even in your own home devotional times. Um, use that prayer guide and consider what God would have you give. Coming up on Sunday, March 17th, is going to be a special day. We have our students who are going to be leading worship for us that day. It's always an exciting time for our church when our students uh, can get up and lead worship. Um, I love the opportunity because it, it helps me kind of see who we have coming up through the ranks to serve on our worship teams. Uh, but it gives our students an opportunity to serve in a wonderful way in our church. So make sure you're here for March 17th and show support for our students on that day. Our Good Years, which is our 55 and plus group, um, are going to be joining together on Wednesday, March 20th at noon in the Fellowship Hall for a program on scams. Um, as, as, as you know, there are people out there that, that are trying to scam us. And a lot of times they'll target the older crowd. Um, I know our, our mother-in-law lives at home with us in, a, in, in the basement. We have an apartment down there. And um, she's, she's constantly asking us, can I trust this? Is this something that I can, can, can you know, that I need to, to click on or whatever on her laptop? This is a great opportunity if you're, if you're uh, feeling like maybe you're being a target of some scams. This is a great opportunity for you to learn from Sheriff Roby Richardson and Lieutenant Justin Rothgeb from the Appomattox Sheriff's Office. Um, it's going to be on the 20th, but they're allowing you to register up through Monday the 18th. So they want you to sign up in the church office by noon that day. As we get ready for Easter, we're getting ready for our huge, great Easter expedition, and we have an operation called Operation Egg Fill. We're going to be providing 10,000 eggs on Easter weekend for kids in our community, and we need help filling up those eggs. We're calling it Operation Egg Fill. We're going to be filling 10,000 empty plastic eggs filled with candy. And so what we want you to do is stop by the welcome desk here in the ministry center and pick up a bag or two of empty eggs. And then your job is to fill those eggs with candy and bring them back um, by Sunday, March 17th which is uh, a couple, you know, little bit before Easter. But we want you to get those back to us. And I guess what they're saying is this year, you know, I, in the past, I think they've asked you to tape the eggs together. You don't need to do that this time. But we would love for you to get those eggs and fill up the candy. And then we have our Easter expedition on Saturday, March 30th. It's going to be out in the Liberty Field going from 930 to noon. We're going to have inflatables and games and all kinds of stuff for the kids in the community along with our 10,000 eggs. We're looking for about a dozen families or groups to sign up to help organize a game or distribute eggs at the expedition. There's going to be 12 different locations around Liberty Field. And there's also an, an opportunity to supervise the inflatables and to hand out LBC Kids prize bags. So if you can help with that, please um, scan the QR code that's in the uh, proclaimer, and uh, someone will get in contact with you and give you more information about that. But these are just great ways to reach out into our community, and we would encourage you to be a part of that. It's great to have you. Let's stand 
stand together this morning and let's join our hearts together in worship, lifting up the name of the Lord. Do you have joy this morning? We do. Yes, we do have joy because we have the joy of our salvation, the fact that Christ has redeemed us and has saved us. We come into this place this morning with joy in our hearts, and we want to celebrate his name this morning. So lift it up. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There is joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. Oh, he's worthy. Sing this out. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung upon that cross. Then he rose up from the grave. My God still rolling stones away. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There is joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by his grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. That's reason to sing. Because we were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. And now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by his We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. 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 church give him praise this morning lord you are worthy
Heavenly Father, we pray today that we would see you, God, that we would see Jesus, that we would understand who he is, why he came, but most importantly, that we would understand the cross. God, that you who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. God, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for your substitution. God, that you stood in our place, you took our death, you took our sin, and you gave us your life. And God, for that we are eternally grateful. God, we contemplate today. God, help us to see today that God, you were not just the one who created the world, but you have done a work in the world, that you have overcome sin, death, hell, and the grave. And God, our hearts rejoice. God, we live in this world. God, we thank you that we can live in hope, live in hope of eternity, live in hope of resurrection, live in hope because you have come and given us real hope. God, this has been a difficult few months for people in grief. And God, today I lift up the family of Jack Williams to you. And God, as his family said an earthly goodbye to him yesterday, God, we're thankful for the long life that you gave him, for the love that uh, Jack had for his wife, Merle, and God, just for a, a life that was... Uh, lived uh, so well. And so, God, we're thankful that, God, that at the place of death, you don't leave us with no answers. God, you've come to address that in such a, in such a profound way. God, you have not just given us a word from heaven. You have given us the action of your death and resurrection. God, we pray that you would prepare our hearts as we draw ever closer to Easter Sunday here in a few weeks, that we would understand what you have done in the world, that we would understand your cross, that we would understand the empty tomb. And God, even though these stories are familiar to us from your word, that they would have greater depth, that we would understand them in deeper ways so that our lives can be conformed to your will and your ways, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.
Sunday church. Some people say they can't tell anything's wrong with my voice. Well, I can tell. I have two boys of which I love dearly, but since January they've given me every sickness known to humanity. Uh, so uh, I, I feel like today I probably shouldn't say this. Thursday I started feeling bad again. To God be the glory. So I feel like today as much medication as I have in my body, I'm preaching under the influence. So I hope that uh, this won't lead me into a negative place. So I'm going to do the best I can and you listen the best you can. And hopefully in a few weeks it'll be spring and this sickness will blow out of here because uh, Rusty can take much more, just to be honest. He's at the end of his rope, and uh, he'll be okay as soon as uh, I feel better for more than two weeks in a row, you know, and then I got to get sick again. So anyway, you did, probably didn't need that introduction, but uh, I probably needed to give it. Today we wrap up our series on Jesus identifying himself as I am. The goal of this message series was to focus our mind and heart on the person of Jesus as we approach Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and ultimately Easter Sunday. Sometimes I think that, especially around Easter time, we just focus on the death and resurrection of Jesus, which is fine. However, the Gospels don't just record these final events in the life of Jesus, they focus on the life of Jesus, that Jesus lives a life before us. He discloses himself to us. Somebody just hit the lights over there so you can cut them off. Yep, there you go. Beautiful. Um, so the, that Jesus discloses himself to us in his life and in his death and in his resurrection. And so to get a comprehensive picture of who Jesus is, we have to see this full sweep of not only his death and resurrection, but his life. Now, in the Gospel of John, the life of Jesus is punctuated by I am statements. Now, I am is an Old Testament name for God. There are two main Old Testament names for God. One is Elohim, and the other name is Yahweh. Now, God has many names for himself, as disclosed in the Old Testament, but these two are primary, Elohim and Yahweh. You say, well, what does that matter to me? Well, the first name of God, like in Genesis 1, in the beginning, God, guess what that word is? Elohim. And so that discloses, Elohim discloses that God is creator. It's one of the dominant ideas in that name is God is creator and sustainer of the world. But when God discloses himself to Moses in Exodus 3, God does not disclose himself as Elohim, but Yahweh, which is translated, I am. And this is disclosed as the more personal name of God. And here's the big idea. I think a lot of people, if you ask people, do you believe in God? They say, yeah, I believe in God because I believe God had to create the world. And how could we get the world that we have if God had not created it? And so that's 
Thinking of God as creator is good. But the name of God, Yahweh, is not primarily focused on God as creator, but God as the God who acts in his creation. In some ways, we could think of the Bible as God as creator, but Yahweh discloses that God has an action in the world. He is not just God of creation. He is the God who acts in history. And I think the idea to think that God is doing something not just to get the world going, but God is doing things in history along the way, and ultimately God will be the one to bring history to its ultimate conclusion. The question that the Gospels are asking is what is God doing in history? What is God doing in the world? And the Gospel of John discloses that God is doing all manner of things in his world, in the person of Jesus. The idea that God is not just the one who created the world, but has an action in the world is a profound idea. There are seven I am statements in the Gospel of John, and as of today, we'll, we will have covered all of them. I kind of culminate today with Jesus disclosing himself as I am he in John 18. Just by way of review, what are the seven I am statements and what do they mean in the Gospel of John? Jesus, first of all, says, I am the bread of life. When Jesus takes five loaves and two fish and feeds the multitude, he discloses himself as the bread of life. Jesus says that the majority of humanity does not want deep and true satisfaction Jesus says they often just want more bread. They just want a little something to tide them over until they can get something else. And Jesus says, if you see what I am doing in history, if you see what I am doing in my life, I can give you deep and profound satisfaction that will move you beyond the mere desire to just have more bread. You can actually have the bread of life. Jesus, in his second I am statement, says, I am the light of the world. While God created a world full of light, it was, it was humanity that shrouded the world in darkness. Jesus enters the world as the light of the world, but it is us, it is our hearts that are dark. And so if we can see the revelation that Jesus gives to us, we can be called out of our moral darkness and into what God has for us. The third and fourth I am statement, I am the door of the sheep and I am the good shepherd in some ways go together. The idea that God is the good shepherd, that he has authority over the sheep, he's the door, but he's also the good shepherd. Jesus as the good shepherd, which today in John 18 will be seen in full relief. Jesus as the good shepherd protects his sheep and ultimately lays his life down for his sheep. In the fifth I am statement, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Yes, there will be a resurrection in the future for all believers. However, Jesus says, if you can see what I'm doing... He says, I'm the one that has the power of resurrection. It it will be me. It will be Jesus who on the last day will call the saints to arise because in himself, he has the power over sin and death. Jesus says in his sixth I am statement, he says, since there is one God, there is only one way to God. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, the exclusive claim that Jesus makes that there is only one way to God and it's found in the person of Jesus. And then last week, the seventh I am statement, Jesus says, because you have been connected to me, I am the true vine, Jesus says. And so since I am the true vine, if you stay connected to me, you can produce fruit. It is important to understand the actions of Jesus in the gospel and how he discloses himself in all of these I am statements. In some ways, the actions of Jesus in John are punctuated by the self-identification 
Jesus is saying, I am doing something in history. I hope you can see it. But the culmination of Jesus' work is in his suffering, in his death, and in his resurrection. And today in John 18, we get to see the beginning of the suffering of Jesus as he walks to the cross. Now, we have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I think what's interesting today is to see how John focuses on these events, the events of the sufferings of Jesus, and yet to see the unique emphasis that John has as he discloses Jesus as the great I am, even as Jesus is arrested, even as Jesus begins his suffering to the cross. So if you have a Bible today, John 18 verses 1 through 18, we will see how in some ways Jesus culminates his work as he moves ever close, closer to the cross. The first big idea today is Jesus' identification as the great I am reveals the unique power Jesus has even in his suffering. Notice these first six verses. It says, after Jesus had said these things, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley where there was a garden and he and his disciples went into it. Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas took a company of soldiers and some temple police from the chief priest and the Pharisees and came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing everything that was about to happen to him, went and said to them, Who is it you're looking for? Jesus the Nazarene, they answered, I am he. Jesus told them. Judas, who betrayed him, was also standing with them. When he told them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Now, this is the famous scene of Jesus in the Kidron Valley, where John says there was a garden. We know in the other Gospels that this garden is called the Garden of Gethsemane. It's the Garden, Gethsemane means the place of the olive press. There have been on two occasions where I've been able to go to the Garden of Gethsemane, pray in the Garden of Gethsemane, and there in the Garden of Gethsemane are still trees, if you can believe this, olive trees from the first century. Because an olive tree does not just uh, actually can get new growth from the trunk or from like the roots. So the tree can just keep on growing. And literally, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane is kind of a low place and the temple, the Jerusalem temple, is literally right up the hill. And so oftentimes when we think about what was Jesus doing in the Garden of Gethsemane, if you've read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you think he is agonizing. And he did agonize in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was in the Garden of Gethsemane that he prayed and sweat with great drops as great drops of blood. This was a place of profound agony. But John today does not want to focus on the agony of Jesus at all. John today wants to let us know that Jesus as the great I am, doing a work in history, is marching to the cross with eyes wide open, with full authority of what he's doing. He, his life is not taken from him. He is laying his life down. This is what is happening. John discloses to us that Jesus is God. One of, the, one of the things that God possesses that we don't is that God knows the future. You don't know the future, but God knows the future. And John today pulls back the veil and says, because Jesus is God, he saw everything crystal clear. It says in verse 4, then Jesus knowing everything that was about to happen. And John 
as Judas betrays Jesus and the soldiers come to get Jesus, Jesus is not caught off guard. Jesus is not stunned. Jesus is not uh, unaware of what is going on. Jesus confronts those who come to him and often is the case, Jesus asks a question when already knowing the answer for the purpose of letting people disclose their own hearts, maybe for their sake, not for Jesus' sake. And Jesus, as he is about to be arrested, he asks the question, who are you looking for? And then they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And then Jesus thunders back at them saying, I am he. When that happens, those who come to arrest Jesus under the utterance of the divine name, are thrown off of their feet. And you can see so many things happening at once here that Jesus, under the utterance of the divine name, the soldiers assume the posture that one should assume when one is confronted with the glory of God. Many times in the Old Testament, when people are able to see God, they... Moses is told, take off your shoes for the place where you stand is holy ground. And many other occasions when God is seen in all of his holiness and all of his glory, there is only but one place to go and that is low. And what Jesus is saying, even though the people around them don't know what's happening, it is God who is acting in history, the God who created the world, the God who is now has a work in the world, has disclosed himself even in this most chaotic of moments. Now I want you to see that not only these events that look chaotic Jesus says, I know everything is about to happen. He also says that, well, this is that Jesus' walk to the cross is the great action of God. And in some ways, if you can understand this, that God's action of redemption on the cross is actually a greater work than God's creation of the world. This is that this is the great culmination of what God is doing in the world. Notice the second big idea, that Jesus' identification as the great I am discloses the compassionate care that he has for his disciples. Verse 7 says, and then then he asked them again, who is it you're looking for? Jesus the Nazarene, they said. I told you I am he. Jesus replied, so if you're looking for me, let these men go. And this was to fulfill the words that he had said, I have not lost one of those you have given to me. Jesus is the good shepherd. Jesus, as the good shepherd, will lay his life down for his sheep. And not only is Jesus going to ultimately lay his life down for his sheep, In this text, Jesus is protecting his disciples even in this moment of chaos. Because Jesus says, look, if you're looking for me, then let these other disciples go. Certainly, um, the, the whole trial of Jesus leading up to his crucifixion is totally bogus. Jesus is going to be arrested. Listen, uh, you know, we, we can, we hear all kinds of, they say, well, uh, justice wasn't served in this situation or the other. Just think about this. Jesus is praying in the middle of the night. He is going to be arrested probably likely around midnight, and he is going to be hauled off to some type of trial at two and three o'clock in the morning. Now, listen, if you're being tried by somebody at two or three o'clock in the morning, justice is probably not going to be served. You know what I'm saying? Somebody's got a hit job on you, and they had a hit job on Jesus. No, what, there's no two ways around this because Jesus is going to have a trial in the middle of the night, then it's going to be before Pontius Pilate at six o'clock in the morning, and then we know Jesus on the cross by nine o'clock. I mean, Jesus is on trial 
you know, they already had a guilty verdict before they ever had the trial. Jesus is on trial literally all night before he is finally taken to a cross and the gospels tell us that he's on the cross at nine o'clock in the morning. So this, there is no desire for real justice here. There's a group of folks who just want Jesus dead. That's what's happening. And so in a situation like this, if someone wants Jesus dead so bad that the most likely thing would be is that they don't just arrest Jesus, they also arrest, guess what? Everybody with Jesus. Jesus says, hey, look, I'm the good shepherd. Look, leave them alone. If you want me, just take me. I think verse 9 is a very interesting verse because Jesus had said previously in the gospel of John that he was the good shepherd. But notice verse 9, it says this was to fulfill the words. Most of the time when the gospel writers say, and this was to fulfill something, it's usually to fulfill an Old Testament promise. It's one of the few times in the Bible it says this was to fulfill, fulfill the words that, listen, he had said, Jesus Jesus says, this is me enacting being the good shepherd. This isn't some Old Testament promise. This is what I said. I said, I'm the good shepherd, and you can see that I'm laying my life down for the sheep and leave these men alone. One of the things that I want to communicate to you as we draw closer to Easter is the profound concern that Jesus has for us. Jesus is laying down his life for disciples in the gospel who won't even identify with him. Later on in this episode, Simon Peter will deny Jesus. And Jesus is willing to lay down his life for us, not because of our goodness, but because of his goodness towards us. And I think we should, one of the things that should astound us is the profound, unconditional, sacrificial love of Jesus, the good shepherd towards us. You know, the truth is to say nobody loved you like Jesus loved you is, is about as big of an understatement as can be made. You know, I hope, I hope you've been loved and loved deeply by someone but I can tell you this, no one loved you like Jesus loved you. Because Jesus saw your heart. Jesus saw your sin. Jesus saw your shortcomings. And with full confident authority, he walked to a cross and said, I'll take your sin and I'll put it on myself. And so... I think as we approach the cross, we should not only see the cross, but we should see Jesus who goes to the cross to express towards us an unbelievable amount of love and care. The sad truth is, after Jesus has taught his disciples, they still don't understand his mission. Because notice, Simon Peter totally misunderstands what Jesus is trying to do. Notice the Third big idea, Jesus' identification as the great I am reveals the unique nature of Jesus' mission. Verse 10 says, Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. At that, Jesus said to Peter, Seeth your sword, am I not to drink the cup the Father has given to me? Then the company of soldiers, the commander, and the Jewish temple police arrested Jesus and tied him up. First they led him to Annas. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. And Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was advantageous that one man should die for the people. After all of this time, after Jesus has proclaimed to, to the disciples that he has a kingdom, but it's not like a kingdom of this world. It's a kingdom that is different from the kingdoms of the world, that he has a different mission than, than other missions, that they ought to see the unique thing that Jesus is doing. They don't. 
And so when Simon Peter gets in this context and he sees that they are arresting Jesus, Simon Peter, who is often impulsive, does a very impulsive act, grabs his sword out of his belt and whacks off Malchus's ear. In some ways, this is only, uh, it, we're told in the other gospels that Jesus mercifully puts the man's ear back on his head and basically says, look, put away your sword. This isn't Jesus's mission. What is Jesus's mission? Sometimes um, we ought to carefully hear what Jesus is saying to his disciples because Jesus tells Peter, put away your sword. And then ask him a question. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given to me? The idea of drinking the cup, you say, what does that mean? Well, in the Old Testament, drinking the cup is the cup of God's judgment. And this is, this is just the way it is that God, because he is God, hates sin. God, because he is God, cannot not judge sin. If there is sin, there must be judgment. That's just the way it is. If there is um, sin and iniquity, God, because he is holy, must judge it. You say, well, I don't want God to judge sin. Well, then he won't be God because he will be able to accept unholiness. And God is morally pure. I mean, who would want a God who's not morally pure? It wouldn't be God. And when God sees moral impurity, he must meet moral impurity with judgment. This is just kind of God 101. And the, the mystery and beauty of the cross is God who says sin must be judged rather than taking the judgment of God and pouring it out on us. By the way, if God judged us all, the only accusation that we could make of God, you ready for it, is that he is just. If God judged all of us, if God poured out his judgment on all of us, the only thing we could say is, you have seen it straight. You have judged wisely. You have done what is good. That's all we could say. Just like if we were all some type of hardened criminal who had done something horrible and the judge came down and says, guilty on what you have done, the only thing we could say in that context is, God, uh, is that the judge has judged rightly. But the, the glory of the cross is this, that God, rather than dumping divine judgment on us, has taken on flesh to stand in our place, and rather than dumping the wrath of God on us, has taken the wrath upon himself. And if you want to know the greatest thing that God has done in history, it's that. Is that he has taken our sin, he has taken our death, he has taken our darkness, and in an act of unbelievable love, has taken it on himself. And if you want to see the great actions of God in history, there it is. Greater than the creation of the world is the cross. And that's what the gospel shout to us. And he tells Simon Peter, look, put away your sword. That's not the program. I am not here to cause more death. I am here to end death. I am not to, he says, there will be one great act of final judgment and it'll be on me. And if you accept me, there'll be no more judgments because I'll have taken it all on a cross. Now, one would think you have walked with Jesus. You have heard what Jesus said. You would assume that at the end of the gospels, there would be profound fidelity to Jesus, that everybody would see his program and be worshiping him. I mean, come on, think about this. You're the divine, I mean, these are Jewish men, all of these 
with Jesus. They know the divine name Yahweh. When Jesus says, I am, and the soldiers fall down on the ground, it looks like to me they ought to notice, okay, Jesus is doing something here, and we ought to get with the program. The sad truth is, after all of this, talking about the world being a place of great darkness, after all of this, the disciples struggle to stay with Jesus. I think this is the most humbling thing as we walk ever closer to Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday, is after God has demonstrated all of this towards us, we as the disciples can struggle to have fidelity to Jesus even after he has disclosed himself to us in such profound ways. Notice this sad episode here. The fourth big idea is Jesus' identification as the great I am should humble us due to our inability to be faithful to Jesus. Notice this, verse 15, meanwhile Simon Peter was following Jesus, as was another disciple. That disciple was an acquaintance of the high priest, so he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter remained standing outside by the door. So the other disciple, the one known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the girl who was the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. Then the slave girl who was the doorkeeper said to Peter, you aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? I am not, he said. Now the slaves and the temple police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold. They were standing there warming themselves, and Peter was standing with them warming himself. You know, it's clear to me that John is trying to show a profound contrast because on one hand, Jesus has strongly identified himself as I am. And when Simon Peter is asked, hey, are you with him? Simon Peter says, I am not. You know, Simon Peter doesn't just deny Jesus one time, he denies Jesus three times. And Jesus tries to look at Simon Peter and says, look, Simon Peter, Satan is going to try to sift you like wheat. I'm going to pray for you. And I just think as we draw ever closer to the cross, we might think, I I think I'm faithful to Jesus. I can't imagine a situation that would get me to deny Jesus. I can't think of a scenario that my fidelity to Jesus wouldn't be what it should be. Let me just say this. If Simon Peter would deny Jesus, you can deny Jesus. And if you think you wouldn't deny Jesus then you're probably in a really good situation to deny Jesus. I mean, Simon Peter said, look, if everybody else leaves you, Jesus, I'm going to be here with you. And then as soon as Simon Peter has an opportunity, he's going to deny Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. I think it's so subtle. It, you know, Simon Peter is, is such a hard guy to understand Because in one moment, he's ready to get into a knife fight. And then in the next moment, literally, it says, then the slave girl who was the doorkeeper, a young girl, means somebody with no intimidation. I mean, so what? Big burly Galilean fisherman Simon Peter says to a girl, yeah, I'm with him. What you going to do about it? Nothing. She's a little girl. It takes a a little girl to ask Simon Peter, you aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? And before Simon Peter even knows what's coming out of his mouth, he says, no, I'm not with him. And I, I just think that this is put here in the Gospels for us to realize the profound difficulty that we might have to stay faithful to Jesus as Simon Peter couldn't. I want to give you a word of hope, however, because it's only here in the Gospel of John. You know, some people say, you know, everybody denied Jesus, everybody left Jesus. Well, that's not true. 
Because if you read carefully in verse 15, it says, meanwhile, Simon Peter was following Jesus. And then guess what it says? And another disciple. And then this disciple says, was an acquaintance with the high priest. The most likely identification of who this other disciple was, who was following Jesus, is the author of the gospel of John. John, son of Zebedee. And actually John, who doesn't give great fanfare to himself and remains, an, and remains shrouded in mystery here, it would actually be John who would follow Jesus, who ultimately would pick up Jesus' mom, Mary. And when Jesus hangs on a cross, everybody else is gone. But guess who remained? Mary and John. And so in some ways, John gives us hope here that you don't have to deny Jesus. That there is a way to walk with him. There is a way to stay with him even in the toughest moments. Listen, Jesus says, I am the great I am. I have acted in history. You want to hear the mystery of Christianity? The greatest action that God has had in history is the cross and empty tomb. That's the greatest event of all of history. Greater than the creation of the world, you ready for this? Is Jesus dying and rising again so that there can be new creation, so that there can be resurrection, so that the world that God created will one day God, the God who created the world has acted in the world to undo that which we have done to the world, sin and death, so that one day, one glorious day, that the world itself can be made new. And the Gospels say that God has done this, and it is recorded here. And if you want to know what God is doing in the world, look at Jesus and look at what has happened, especially in his death and resurrection. I wonder today, do you think the cross is the greatest event God has ever done? If you don't, then you as the disciples are missing God's great action. Jesus says, you want to see God? You want to see what he's done? then see Jesus, see his cross, see his empty tomb, see his care for you and me. You know, some of you today are here today and you're not a Christian. There's never been a time nor a place where you have said, God, I admit I'm a sinner. And God, by faith, I trust in Jesus. If you're today and you're not a Christian, why not today won't you walk an aisle? I'll take a Bible, I'll show you how you can be a Christian. I will, you can leave this place knowing that when you die, you'll spend eternity with God. And if you don't have that worked out, listen, I've attended way too many funerals these last two months. And you say, well, I'm not going to die anytime soon. You don't know that. You don't know that. You ought to be, you ought to be right with God. You ought to know, you ought to know that you know that you've trusted in Jesus. And then if you are a Christian, you know, I feel like today we ought, to, we ought to pray for ourselves to see Jesus and then to have faithfulness to him. That we won't be as the disciples were, the majority of the disciples, abandoning Jesus, missing what he's doing. That we ought to say, God, would you keep me faithful to you to see what you're doing so that I can live a life of obedience to you. Listen, the altar is open. If you need prayer for any reason, the altar is open. And why don't we just take a few moments and turn our hearts in prayer and ask God for his insight so that we can walk more faithfully with him. Heavenly Father, we pray. God, we pray that we would see what God is doing in his world. 
God, we thank you that you do not stand aloof from your world, just letting us struggle. But God, you have entered into our world. You have entered into your world. God, you have taken on our struggle. You have taken on our sin. You have even taken on our death. And God, may we see what you have done. And God, we today just want to lift our heart in thanks that since we could not we could not take care of our own sin, you took care of it. God, may we see the glory of the cross. May we see you as the good shepherd. May we see you as the one who satisfies. May we see you as the only way to God, the way, the truth, and the life. May we see you as the resurrection. May we see you as the one who is the very source of life, as a vine that gives life to the branches. All the things that you have disclosed of yourself, God, may we see them. And God, may we live our life in light of them. God, we thank you that you aren't just a creator who has created and walked away. God, you are the one who created and then looked upon us in our, in our plight and has entered into it and through the cross and resurrection has overcome it. God, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. As we leave this morning, let's stand together and let's acknowledge the worthiness of our Savior, Jesus.
God bless you. Have a wonderful day in the Lord.